different groups. So all I'm talking about today is I'm just going to talk about a handful of what we call social VR worlds. I'm only going to talk about, talk about my personal favorites. There are quite a few social VR worlds out there today. How many of you know what a social VR world is? A few. So many of you, this will be a review for you. You, you probably already hang out in, in many of these worlds. Uh, I'm just really summarizing what they are and what, uh, what kind of creative potential we can see in each of these worlds. Some of you might prefer some worlds, which I will not even mention today. I'm just going to pick my four or five favorites that I like to talk about. You might have your own. For everyone else, a social VR world is kind of like a VR application, a virtual reality application or a video game, except you are socializing with other people, hanging out with them. You don't necessarily have to uh, get a high score to win at anything. You can just do nothing and hang out with people, just as we are doing here today. You can have academic presentations in there or just whatever, hang out at a virtual bar. Okay. However, many of these worlds are starting to design certain features within them that allow you to also become a prosumer, that allow you to create as well as consume. Okay. We're producers and consumers, prosumers. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly go over a couple worlds where I see some creative potential. I've been hanging out in these worlds, sometimes for hours on end. Uh, it's hard to get out of virtual reality once you're in, once you're fully immersed. Uh, I have a, an HTC Vive headset. Some of you might have one already with these controllers. It's room scale. You can walk around. I also have an Oculus Quest, which is for mobile VR. Okay, uh, it's a cheaper device, but it runs on wireless, apparently. So, you know, I should be able to access some of these worlds using even a wireless mobile VR headset, and that is the case with a couple of these. So today, let's see if this works. Okay, good. Uh, I'll just quickly talk about my background. Uh, I've been exploring the creative potential of, uh, well, the internet chat room since 1996. Uh, I started experimenting with social media, creative potential. Actually, it's not mentioned here, but probably before Facebook, so 2001, 2002. Uh, there were social networks before Facebook. I don't know if you realize that. Um, and I've been in screen-based virtual worlds. By screen-based, I mean on the computer with a screen uh, since like 2001. And these are, those were also social virtual worlds, but they aren't immersive like we have today. They're not embodied. I can't just go inside them and hang out in them that way. Uh, I had to wait until 2016 to be able to afford a Vive headset so I could go into uh, social VR. And that, uh, again, 2016 is around the time I got in there. So I've had many roles uh, within these kinds of worlds. I've been a user, sometimes a consumer, just hang out and do nothing and just figure out what people are doing and hang out with them. Sometimes I create stuff in there. I have created uh, virtual characters inside of, uh, well, the screen-based virtual worlds anyway. I've done performance art in there. I've composed music for virtual orchestras in some of these environments. Uh, I've also you know, uh, done some philosophy in there, some academic scholarship in there. That's not too exciting, really, but I've done that. Uh, so I've done a bunch of this stuff since, well, 2001, we'll say. But the real, okay, this is just me in, in this virtual world called Second Life. It was a popular virtual world from like 2003 until, well, I guess it's still around. Uh, and there are a few, maybe hundreds, uh, tens of thousands of people still there. Uh, but I've been exploring these screen-based virtual worlds since like, uh, well, as I said, 2001. There were some precursors to Second Life called Active Worlds, Cybertown, Roomancer, On Live Traveler. These are kind of obscure names now. But th this is all me in a screen-based virtual world. Okay, so I've done a whole bunch of things in these screen-based virtual worlds. But now we're really at the next level where we're entering immersive social VR. In the olden days, I had a screen to protect me from interacting with the world. I could watch my screen, and then I could have my character do whatever I wanted with that character. And even if my character got into trouble, I was on the other side of the screen. Okay, so I felt not psychopathic, but I felt like I could do a lot more in these worlds with some kind of remove. Now, in immersive virtual reality, I am that character literally in that world. So whatever I do, I'm now vulnerable to criticism from others and social interaction and so on. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today are my five, yeah, five favorite uh, social VR worlds. Okay, one of these worlds no longer exists. That is Facebook's world, Facebook Spaces. It has now evolved into Facebook Horizon, which will be launched uh, in January, hopefully. Uh, so I'm going to talk about five of these worlds. I'm going to talk about what you can do creatively in these worlds so far, and I'm also going to talk about very quickly how accessible they are to the average consumer. Because I don't think you're going to be able to get a real creative community going until you have proper accessibility, until you have a whole bunch of people inside these worlds. These worlds are not too populated at the moment. We're talking about, well, okay, in some cases like VRChat, thousands of people, but otherwise hundreds 
of people are really only in, in here so far. You need like millions of people to make a real creative community emerge. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the first two are related to that other world I showed you, Second Life. The founder of Second Life, the creator of Second Life, made this one called High Fidelity. Uh, and the company that he used to work for, Linden Labs, or used to own, uh, started Sansar, the competitor. So it's kind of like a Coke versus Pepsi kind of comparison there. And yet it's really the same people behind it all, right? Uh, and then as I said, Facebook has a virtual world. Uh, there's this great indie world from the Czech Republic called Neos VR. Uh, and also from Vancouver, apparently originally, VR chat. So we have a local world too, which is actually the most popular of the five here is the one that originated at least partially in Vancouver. Uh, there are other worlds, if you're into social VR already, many of you might be supporting alt space, you might be rooting for that one. Uh, I'm not gonna go into why I didn't pick it right now. So this is the one uh, from the founder of Second Life. He started this virtual world called High Fidelity. It's totally embodied when you talk, your avatar, the lips move, it's often in perfect sync. You can fly, like literally fly. It's not just like you're on a keyboard and using the up key for the screen to watch your character fly. You can actually fly and you feel like you're flying. When you land, you fall forward. Get the sense of vertigo. It's like that. But what's also interesting is now we're starting to see live concerts. Actually live, not virtually live in that sense. Before, used to stream some kind of, a DJ used to stream in their pre-recorded canned music into a screen-based virtual world. And people would press an, a dance animation button and pretend to dance. Meanwhile, they're behind the screen. Now people are actually moving their limbs and dancing in these worlds. And this is actually, for real, Thomas Dolby. I don't know if you've heard of Thomas Dolby. She blinded me with science. That was a pop hit from the 1980s. I grew up as a kid listening to Thomas Dolby. Anyway, here he is playing live, literally live. That's literally him inside VR in his avatar. He's not just streaming stuff in musically. He's actually performing for real in this world. He's, he's using his actual voice to sing live. Uh, I think he was playing the real keyboard. I wasn't totally sure if he was actually pressing the keys. But look at the population of this world. And these are most, most of the people who are embodied within VR. It's like attending a real festival concert. So what we're seeing is not just people like streaming in canned music into these virtual worlds, but people actually being live, actually being there, actually making live mistakes inside this kind of virtual world. Uh, I think there were about 300 people that attended this event. Uh, I'm in here somewhere. I think this is me over here. No, that's me. Okay, so it was a great time. It was just like being at a real concert. Uh, this is uh, uh, what they call a load test or a stress test. We're trying to see how many of these characters, avatars, they can fit inside a VR. They got around 300 in one room, mostly in body. Okay, that's not too bad. Uh, what's even more uh, interesting and accessible at high fidelity now is that you can get a phone app right now, like on Android or iOS, and make your own avatar. That sounds simple enough. But now you can, uh, and hopefully it will look like you. This kind of looks like me, except uh, with a different hairstyle and with some pounds shaved off. It's an idealized version of me. Anyway, I made this in a few seconds, maybe maybe a couple minutes on uh, a, phone, a phone app, and then I could upload my avatar into this virtual world and wear myself and walk around as myself. So that was quite convenient and quite accessible. However, to run high fidelity, a world like this, you need a pretty good computer. You need a PC, not a Mac, and, and the GPU, the video card, needs to be about a, a 1060 equivalent or higher. So you need a pretty good computer. If you don't have a good enough computer, uh, you won't be able to run a world like this, unfortunately. So even though you can make yourself right now on your phone right now, you can do it, it's going to be much harder for you to have the money or the resources to get in there and actually be yourself. Uh, uh, this is just a quick overview of the demographics that are within High Fidelity. There's a, uh, really, there's a small community. It looks like there are hundreds of people, but actually there's only about 30 people. Uh, and they're kind of a geeky, nerdy crowd. Uh, there, what we have in High Fidelity is a little bit of in-world building. By that I mean your avatar can actually make objects appear and you can stretch them with your hands and then texture them or animate them or script them, program them. Okay, uh, there's a little bit of that going on here. You can also, they have virtual cameras and uh, uh, well, video cameras and selfie cameras so you can take pictures of yourself. You can stream videos to, uh, maybe not uh, in high fidelity, but some of these other worlds to Twitch and some streaming sites like that so you can uh, send video of yourself if you like. Again, you need a pretty good computer to run this though. Here's another world, Sansar. Uh, it is a graphically richer world than high fidelity. Uh, you definitely need a good computer to run this. 
Uh, I would say you need at least a 1080 GPU to run this one. This will not work on a mobile Quest-like device. Uh, that's me in uh, Sansar. Uh, this world's kind of empty in a way. Oh, there's very few people here. We're talking about maybe like 50 people at a time. And so it's easy for you to have an introverted moment to yourself with no one around. It's hardly social when you think of social VR. I like it because I like hanging around uh, nice computer graphic, computer graphical worlds, doing nothing. But uh, on the social level, it needs more work. Now, you can build these amazing worlds, and you can sort of build your avatar, your character, but it's tough. Uh, you need, uh, Sansor has its own uh, world building software, but you have to use your desktop to use it. You have to go outside of VR to use it. It's kind of a limitation, I think. And you need the same skill sets you would need to do something on 3D Studio Max or Maya or Unreal or Unity or something like that. So it, there's a bit of a barrier to entry. Not everyone can just, I can't just go there and just make a world very quickly in VR. I can't just customize my avatar super quickly. Um, I've tried to make my own avatar in uh, Sansar. And what happens is Sansar is so buggy right now, you can't even put your clothes on. You put, they'll give you pants, and then you try and pull up your pants, and they'll just fall down. So you spend like an hour pulling up your pants. And then you try and shape them, and then they get too wobbly, and kind of like that MC Hammer harem pants. You get the, so I made my own glitch kind of fashion based on my frustrations with the software. Um, uh, but there are professional developers uh, using Sansar, like the Hello Kitty company. I don't know who owns Hello Kitty, but they have their own Hello Kitty world. Sanrio? That's it. Sanrio. Sanrio, right? S-A-N-R-I-O. Sanrio, very good. Sanrio, thank you. You've reminded me. It's called Sanrio Room or something like that there. Uh, and uh, you, you are correct. And uh, again, there's no one here, as you can see. It's just me waiting for people to show up All right, and be social. Uh, that's also me. Um, but anyway, this is an older crowd. People that already have experience with uh, building worlds on computer graphic platforms on desktops. Uh, not many people there. You can't build inside there, and you need a very good computer to do anything. This was Facebook's old world. It's now uh, it's been canceled. It's been shifted over to Facebook Horizon, which happens in January uh, 2020. That's also me there. Uh, as you can see, the graphics are much more primitive. But what I like about this one is you can actually contact everyone else on Facebook using the virtual world. So I can call up my friend with a regular phone as an avatar. I can prank call them and show up like this and talk, talk to them, video chat with them. So and I, I can also talk to my parents on Facebook. I can just go into VR and, and go through the other world to the, the regular Facebook world and talk to them. That's interesting. In Facebook, you can also take selfies, tons of selfies, and post them. You can make your own t-shirts, upload your photo, and uh, wear your own t-shirt. Uh, but other than that, there, everything else seems a bit primitive. We'll see where Horizon goes in uh, January. I'm just speeding up a little bit here because I have like a 20-minute limit. Uh, so you can do selfie sharing. You can draw in the VR world. You can get a pen, a virtual pen, and draw around. I guess that's sort of creative. Uh, you could definitely live stream. I can video call people from here. I can stream to YouTube probably or Twitch or Facebook video or something like that. What was interesting or what is going to be interesting about this, this new world, Horizon, is that uh, it will run on the Oculus Quest, a mobile device that is much cheaper than uh, the full-on uh, HTC Vive or the Oculus Rift uh, VR headsets. So this is going to be much more accessible. Whoever you do, need a Facebook account. So you have to surrender your privacy. Most of you have done this already, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, uh, so you, but you need a Facebook account. And you have to use your real name, which I don't necessarily like. So no, I, I'm very accountable for all my actions uh, inside this virtual world. OK, uh, let's see. This is a world I'm very fond of. This is me here in the purple guy taking a sort of a selfie using a video camera. I'm trying to stream to Twitch there. I don't know if I succeeded. This is a world from the Czech Republic called Neos VR. It's an independently made uh, virtual world. And yet, it's really quite amazing. The in-world building is really complete here. You can build in-world, so you can make things appear and texture them. You can program in here. You can do some, some kinds of AI uh, applications within this world. And there's liter literally one guy that made this whole world. has programmed everything, interface everything. I think he's in his 20s, and he's just made everything. It's really quite impressive. So this is for people that want to build, that want to create, that want to program inside virtual reality without having to go uh, you know, to the screen. Okay, So I think 
I, I personally like this one the best. Uh, this is just me photobombing people, taking a bunch of photos. Nothing really creative there. Um, this is my friend Liz. Uh, she's, she's originally from Newfoundland. She's opened up a, uh, I think it's a scripting window, a programming window, where you can program objects to move in certain places or to change the properties of, the, of these objects. High Fidelity, that other world that I first mentioned, has a little bit of this, but it's not quite as developed as, as we see in Neos. So you can program characters, you can program objects, you can create whatever you want, you can texture them entirely in the world without having to leave VR. I think that's very important. Uh, uh, I'm quite vain, that's me looking in a mirror of myself, and this is another guy that has a tablet. That tablet's very functional, kind of like an iPad. That iPad, so the virtual iPad works almost like a real iPad, entirely within VR. And I don't know if he made it, but him or one of his friends made that in a matter of hours, probably. Maybe, maybe okay, days, maybe not hours. Okay, entirely in world, not going to desktop to make it. This is my view here, you can see the buttons I can click on, I click on these. Also, my wrist will have buttons. I can rotate and select buttons on my wrists. So it's quite immersive as compared to other worlds. Is my time up? Is that a, a beep? Trap door opens? Okay. Um, anyway, <laughs> this works on mobile devices like the Quest and uh, a good PC. Uh, so it has in-world programming, scripting, live streaming to Twitch, in-world building, uh, the community is not very big yet. It's very much an independent, do-it-yourself kind of community. But I say they're, they're the most of the most of the potentials here. Uh, this is the most popular social VR world, and, and as I said earlier, it's, it was partially invented in Vancouver, um, called VR Chat. Uh, here we have users in the thousands. Some claim millions, but I think it's more like thousands for real. Uh, the demographic here: uh, a lot of youth are on here. YouTube, a lot of YouTubers have promoted VR chat as a place to cause trouble and make pranks and bug people. So the user base is relatively big here. Uh, now, in terms of making your character so far and the world, you have to go to uh, an application or a uh, software like Unity to make your world. So you can make, you can't really see here, but fairly realistic looking worlds in Unity, but that's on a desktop, that's outside of VR. To make your avatar, it's the same idea. You have to go to Unity or Blender or one of these other kinds of pieces of software on a desktop outside of VR to make it. But you, there's quite a bit of variety in there. Uh, there are in-world tools that you can use. This is, a, this is a selfie camera. I'm taking a picture of myself in a mirror, in front of a mirror with a selfie ca camera there. I can stream to uh, Twitch, I believe that way. Uh, this is uh, me hanging out in front of the, the VR Vancouver community for all those here from the VR <coughs> Vancouver community. Just a quick uh, promotion for you. Okay. This is all me, by the way. All of these are me. Okay. Uh, so the demographics have to do with youth and socializers. Uh, we do see live video streaming here. Uh, and you, you can build avatars and worlds here, but you have to go outside of VR to do that. Unity is the go-to program for that. Uh, however, you can use VR chat, a lower resolution version of it, uh, using the Oculus Quest or some other mobile VR device. It's possible. It does not look as good, but you can use it. So that just increases the user base. Uh, what are my concluding remarks? They're pretty general. Um, the best social VR world, I'm saying, at least for me. Uh, as you notice with each of these worlds, they have something good and something missing, really. They, not all these worlds have everything that you'd want. Uh, so it would be good to have a world. One of these worlds might be the contender where they just use every feature I've shown you and put them all together, or there'll be a brand new world one day. Uh, I don't think social VR is going to take off culturally unless it's super accessible, super cheap, not in the hundreds of dollars, but in the tens of dollars, um, where it allows for mobile connections. Uh, by the time we have the technology to make it that cheap to do that, we're probably going to have augmented reality anyway. As far as I'm concerned, uh, virtual reality is augmented reality with the lights turned off, and you have the fully immersive world. Okay, so uh, social VR by itself might just converge into what we would call augmented reality eventually anyway. Uh, again, it's a bit like the, uh, the Apple versus PC kind of problem. The Macs actually don't even run uh, these worlds at all. So we need, there's some, there are some issues with interoperability of devices. You should be able to have any kind of device and be able to access, let's say, immersive VR or AR uh, easily. Uh, 
And I don't think we're going to see much in the way of masterworks creatively within these social VR worlds until they become extremely accessible, where almost anyone can go inside a world like this and would like to. Perhaps this is common sense for some of you. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Sorry if I spoke too quickly.